Dancing with that music. But you don't want to see my moves. My moves are like not so good. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Come on, you could say it better than that. Hello, everyone. I know it's nine o'clock and some people are already feeling sleepy, but let the energy stay up. These stories that are going to come are going to wake you up. I'm going to make you feel so good. So uh, I know that you haven't, like, I, I just call out the storytellers and you're like, who's this guy? You got programs for that? <laughs> this is like a, like an airline, you know, where you're going from country to country. Uh, but I'm not going to read to you all the instructions because, let's be honest, nobody listens to the instructions. I was on a flight. I was like, whatever. Where's the movie going to start? <laughs> so I'm going to let you read the bios of every storyteller at your own time. If you, there's a storyteller that you love, I know you love everyone. But if there's a storyteller that you want, oh, I want to hear another story. They, some of them had the website in there, so check it out. Write down the website or take the, take the program with you if you want to. So let's bring our next storyteller, AK. So the late Anthony Bourdain once said while filming in Nigeria that Nigerians have the greatest hustle of any people he's ever met. But for me, as a Nigerian American who grew up in Indiana, I got none of that. <laughs> but I had to learn the hard way how to hustle from a recent trip I took to Morocco a couple years back. We're going to pick up this pick up this story when I got off the train with my friend Ibrahim, who I was traveling with, in Marrakesh in Morocco. We had been traveling for about four hours on this train in a very, very compact quarters with no air conditioning on a very, very hot summer day. We got off the train and we were tired, we were hungry, all we wanted to do was get to our hostel and also get some food. Now we had been traveling in Morocco at this point for about six or seven days, so we knew a little bit of what's going on. So we went to find a cab and we found the first person we can find. So we found this person and he took our baggage from us. And then we were so tired that we made a couple mistakes we usually wouldn't make. And we got in the car without negotiating a price. We get in the car, and Morocco, for those who haven't been, they speak either Arabic or French. I spoke enough French where I could do a lot of the conversation. My friend Ibrahim only spoke English, and since his family's from Pakistan, he also spoke Urdu, but not a lick of French. So I start talking with the guy, literally started asking him, how much for getting from here to the plaza? And he, like a pro, said, in French, don't worry about it, Habibi, which in Arabic means my love. <laughs> and I tried going back and forth, but he just started the car and started driving, right? So then at that point, he started asking me where we were from and all these different things. And I was telling him in French, oh, we're from the US. Now, I made another mistake. I told him where I was from, because he already set the American tax on how much we were going to pay. Right. And then Ibrahim started talking to me, and he just can reconfirm that we were speaking English and everything. So he asked me what my name was, which I told him my first name is Abdul Karim, and my friend's name is Ibrahim, which are Muslim-sounding names. And he was also Muslim as well. So he was like, oh my god, this is great. This is amazing. Starting to butter us up for the shock we were going to get later on. <laughs> So we finally make it to the plaza, right? And we got out of the car. I made sure we had our luggage. And then I ask him, sir, what's the price? And in French, he tells me 150, which means 150 dirhams, right? Now, this trip should only cost about 35, which I knew. So I said, what? But he interpreted that means not understanding. So he wrote it out, 150 in air quotes. So then I told Ibrahim what was going on, and it just started this battle when I was yelling at him, and he was yelling back at me. Ibrahim was yelling at him, and it was just this whole battle back and forth. Then he brought down the price. He's like, okay, okay, 100, to which, I, which I was like, no. And then I picked up a little trick a friend taught me. I just took out whatever I thought was appropriate. I handed it to him, and we started walking away. And at this point, he started saying, voila, which in Arabic means, I swear. And I don't know what he said after that, because we just kept on walking away. <laughs> so we walked away, we went to our hostel, and we dropped off our stuff. 
and we came back to the plaza to get some food. Now, once again, it's a huge plaza with a lot of different people who are there selling different things, many different shows to see. Now, once again, we were tired, we were hungry, not making the best judgment. Um, we were walking around, a guy kept on motioning over for Ibrahim to come over. Um, he's like, come, come, my friend, my friend. Um, and at some point, when we got a little bit closer, so he's like, oh, Shah Rukh Khan, uh, which is the name of a Bollywood Indian actor. He's pointing to Ibrahim, motioning him to come over. Um, to which, at some point, we just didn't care anymore. We just sat down at this restaurant. We looked at the menu, and we ordered some kebabs and some, uh, some couscous, which is the native dish of Morocco. Now, the thing is, we, at, up until this point, we had amazing food in Morocco, just amazingly tasty food. But unfortunately, tonight was not the same. The, the, the meat we had was some of the most stale and taste that we had ever had, and the couscous was dry. Now, soon we asked for our bill, because we just weren't very, very happy. We didn't eat our food, but what we hadn't realized that he also brought out a lot of other things we hadn't asked for. So we, we asked him for our bill, and as he was about to bring out our bill, we saw another uh, family um, it was actually, it was a white, it looked like American family over who had just gotten their bill and they looked upset. But they didn't make any ruckus, they just paid and they left. So when we got our bill, we were afraid for the worst and he charged us four times the price we were expected to pay, right? Now here's the thing, I could have just gotten up but at this point I was tired, I was hungry, I was not making the best judgment. So I started arguing with this guy in French and I told him straight up, sir, this is horrible, this is tasteless, we are not going to pay for this. Now, he had also heard Ibrahim speaking English with me, so he had already set his price that he wanted, right? Now, like I mentioned before, um, Arabic is most Moroccans' first language, French is their second language, and English is a distant third. As I'm arguing with him, he looks at me and he was trying to say the most vile and insulting thing to me. And after I went on my tirade, he looks at me and he says, bro, are you normal? <laughs> and I thought to myself, what? But then I continued speaking. I, I said again, this is horrible. We're not going to pay for this. This is, this is absurd. So then he asked me what my name was. I'm not sure why everyone else asked you what your name was in the arguments. And I told my name is Abdul Karim. He recognized once again that was a Muslim name. And he says, you come to my store, you order food, and you don't want to pay for it. I don't even understand. This is not very Muslim-like. I don't even know if you're Muslim. So. At this point, I'm like, okay, you're gonna deny me my religion because of this? And I wasn't even thinking straight. I was hungry, I was tired, I had bad food. So I just got up and I was like, okay, you're denying me my Islam? You're denying me being Muslim? Okay, so I just started walking away without a care about wanting to pay. Now at this point, three, other, three or four other guys start walking towards us, right? And my friend Ibrahim was afraid, right? So he just takes out 300 dirhams and he hands it to the guy, right? And the guy was so happy. He was literally so happy because he had won this game. He's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much, my friend. Shah Rukh Khan, you're so great. Um, he's, like, he's like, thank you so much. He's like, oh, you know, you're a great guy. But I don't know about your friend. I don't know uh, these black people. I heard that as I was walking away and I just stopped and I thought, man, this went from zero to races really, really quickly, right? But then I also stopped and took a pause and I was afraid. And I wasn't afraid because of the guys who were coming, approaching or the fear of being beaten up. I was afraid because thousands of miles away from home, there were still people who were so narrow-minded and thought this particular way. And I, you know, I think the U.S. has a lot of issues with systemic oppression and racism, and I thought even for a little bit I, ex I had escaped it. But at that moment, I was snapped out of this thought process and, Ibra and listening to Ibrahim yell at this guy and telling him exactly what I would have said to another friend who may have been in this particular situation. He did everything I would have done, except take away the 300 dirhams and run away. <laughs> but in a more serious note, for me, this lesson reconfirms some lessons, some important life lessons that I have learned through life so far. 
And it helped me realize that in these situations, we must not only stick up for ourselves, but in situations in which someone else is facing these things, we must stand up for our friends and also together stick up and fight for fight against those who may be trying to oppress us because of an identity that we have. And together, and only together doing that, we may, we, may we be able to ever overcome any type of racism or oppression. Thank you, guys.